Evening. Yeah, and welcome to the Deliverance Center. YouTubers, welcome to you. I brought my good pointer tonight. <laughs> Look at this. Boom. Look at that thing. AI. All right. Got a nice Bible study for you tonight. Last night, some uh, mentally ill lady showed up here. Apparently, I didn't see it, but she caused a big ruckus. Uh, I have a deliverance training class once a month, the fourth Saturday of the month at noon in that small sanctuary. And then uh, here in this sanctuary, they have we have a prayer meeting. And... Uh, be interested in attending, we would appreciate it. We need somebody to pray for the ministry. What's happening over the last six months or so, the devil's been uh, sending us some exceptionally sick people. Heavy drug addicts, the mentally ill, all of them. And uh, he's doing it deliberately. What he's trying to do is, is uh, scare people, you know, including my staff. He's trying to scare my staff. And... Um, People who act insane cause anxiety in people who are not insane. They don't really like to be around them. So, nationally, uh, mental illness is skyrocketing all over the country, uh, principally because of pot. Everybody smokes pot now. Mental illnesses have gone jumped from here to there. Okay. And we're getting a bunch of referrals of seriously mentally ill people. Some of them are borderline, you know, psychotic, borderline personality disorders, schizophrenics, psychoses. And the devil send them in. And we're trying to minister to them and pray with them, you know, as, as best we can. We don't turn anybody away unless they're like that lady last night, uncontrollable, and you just can't minister to somebody like that. So... We need your prayers because the devil's going to try to damage my staff and embarrass us by sending in these severely mentally ill people. You know, for example, uh, schizophrenics usually are not dangerous. Okay? But if they have a violent component, they'll walk into a movie theater with an AK-40. What do you call them? AK what? 47. 47. Like in Colorado. Remember that one? The guy went into the movie theater. He started mowing down people. That he was a paranoid schizophrenic with a violent attachment. So generally speaking, these people are nonviolent. But the devil's trying to round them up for me and send them to me. Like he's sending me a Christmas present. So I just wanted to warn you about that and ask you if you are available Saturdays on the fourth Saturday of the month. You could come in and pray for our ministry. Man, we would deeply appreciate it because uh, we're getting some really sick people here, right? We want sick people because we want them healed. But the devil's starting to send in people that are insane. Yeah. If you saw my teaching on Dipsicus, then you... Those are the type of people that have different types of personalities in their mind and in their subconscious. So this personality starts talking. This is the real one. They may have more than one. So that's the kind of stuff we're running into. Well, anyway, we want to talk about that anymore. Thanks for your prayers. July 26, next seminar. Let's go to the announcements. So these are always fun. There's all my teaching on youtube.com slash house of healing AZ. Dipsicus is on there. I just mentioned that. <clears throat> if you'd like to help the ministry and switch from Google to Good Search, you can put in our charity name and they'll pay us while you surf the web. Here's the mir mir miracle list. I send a couple dozen of these out a week or so. They're the most important thing I have. And uh, I don't get very many people that will do it, but those who do do it get major breakthroughs. Okay? So 
We do have it in Mongolian, but I didn't have enough space up there to put that on there. I haven't had any requests for it yet. But I got my fingers crossed, somebody's going to ask me for that. You need to go in the Ministry of Deliverance. Hey, this will save you all kinds of time and money and effort. 18 classes. With deliverance demonstrated after each class. That's in the bookstore. What's going on in the world today? This is in the bookstore, the seven churches of Revelation. Wednesday night is our booming Zoom service. I mean, dozens of people are getting delivered from demons at once in this service, 6 o'clock Arizona Pacific time, every Wednesday. You can send me an email if you want, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you the code and the password. You can download our do donation app. You can download that on your cell phone if you're interested. And this is what I was mentioning earlier, the prayer meeting. Uh, fortunately, we've, our numbers have increased, so we're not at the healing house next door. We're here. Sa fourth Saturday of the month, 11 o'clock. Thank you. There's my deliverance training class, as I mentioned, in the small sanctuary right after the prayer meeting at noon. The donation boxes are on our doors there. If you want to donate to the ministry, thank you. If you don't have any money, you're, you're welcome here 100%. You can donate on the website, on the PayPal button, hardcorechristianity.com. And don't forget about my radio programs. I'm on every morning at 7.30, Monday through Friday. Then I'm on Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon. 10.10 10 a.m. Christian Radio. Been on there for 21 years. There's my Sunday morning podcast for my shut-ins. If you don't go to church, I teach the deep things of God on Sunday morning on twitch.tv. Just put in that code HCCADC and, and I'm there. Nine o'clock Pacific time, nine o'clock here in Arizona. YouTubers, please remember to set up your ambush team in your church. You only need two or three people, and then start picking off sick people, praying for them and getting them delivered. Take them one at a time. Start knocking them down. I don't normally get a lot of amens on that one. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, does that work? Yes, I did it years ago at the Dream Center in Scottsdale. I had them lining up. Okay. Monday is our Zoom service for the ladies. Tuesday night is their, is their teaching service here in the small sanctuary. So Mondays and Tuesdays, the ladies. Please don't forget that. 6.30 p.m. Pacific and Arizona time. I wrote three books. They're in the uh, bookstore, Satan, Healing, and Christian Mental Illness. Tonight's broadcast will be rebroadcast, is being broadcast on YouTube and Rumble, from my understanding. You just put that code in there, H O H H C C, and you're, you're there. Then it's replayed later in the week on these three platforms. I'll be at the Carlsbad Senior Center in August, August 10th, Saturday. We'll be there at 10 in the morning, Carlsbad, California. I'll see you there. We had a really good crowd last time we were there. It was great. I just uh, helped start a home group in Germany. Uh, <laughs> this is the name of it. <laughs> and I appreciate your prayers for that. I had my first Zoom service with them, and uh, man, a whole bunch of people got delivered. So it went great. Uh, it's a legitimate group. They're very sincere. They care. And uh, my thought was, hey, why not start a deliverance ministry where Hitler used to be? And why not? This is a little aside. and It's not, not going to be interesting to a lot of people, but <clears throat> 3,000 years ago or so, there used to be Nephilim running all over the place, and six or 7,000 years ago, they were all over the joint when Noah was around, right? Yeah. And uh, these uh, demon-possessed monsters were uh, some kind, I don't have any, I don't really understand them. Okay, so 
I don't do any teaching on Nephilim, but anyway, these things uh, were physically deformed, apparently. They were extremely large, apparently, some of them. They were wicked and evil to the bone, all of them, or most of them, or whatever it was. But anyway, where they had infiltrated uh, in the highest population centers of Nephilim was right on the missionary journeys of Paul. If you look at Paul's four missionary journeys, boop, 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 the Holy Ghost said that the Nephilim, uh, they can stick it in their ear. I'm going to spread the gospel everywhere the Nephilim uh, had high population centers. If you know, if you had four journeys, you look at the map and it shows here's the red one, here's the green one. Well, that's where the Nephilim were in Europe. And God sent Paul there to stick it to him. He'll be sticking it tonight right here at the altar. And I like it when the Holy Ghost sticks it. Well, I thought of that when I thought of this. You know, deliverance services and center in Nazi Germany. Okay. All right, that was for me. I just, that's something I enjoyed. I just threw that in for my own personal giggle. I'll go on then. All right, let's go to the important uh, Bible study tonight. Let's get ready. Romans. Now, you know what Romans is. It's uh, God's ABCs of Christianity. If you do not understand Romans, you don't understand Christianity. God uh, sent Romans to the Gentiles and then he went over here and sent Hebrews to the Messianic Jews. The ABCs of Christianity. If you have never read Hebrews, your knowledge of Christianity, very weak. For example, <clears throat> chapter 1, Paul explains the lost condition of humanity. Chapter 2, he explains the Jews and Gentiles are all the same. They're all born in sin. They're all sinners. Then in chapter 3, he explains uh, the objections the Jewish people had to the gospel of Christ. And in chapter 4, he drops a bomb on everybody. Judaism is out. Salvation by works has been thrown in the trash. Now you are justified by faith in the living Christ. That's the only way I could have got saved. <clears throat> Chapter 5, Paul explains the results. What happens to you when you are justified by faith? What kind of benefits do you have? What happens to you? ABC is a Christianity. If you don't have Romans, you don't understand Christianity. You've only, you're only getting it here, bits and pieces. Paul rolls it out spectacular. This is Christianity. Broom. There it is, A to Z. Does the same thing in Hebrews for the Messianic Jews. Rolls it right out. Number six, he explains salvation. What is salvation? How do you get saved? He goes into detail. Then he explains in chapter seven your new relationship to sin and God after you're justified. Then in chapter 8, he explains how you're delivered from sin and you are now delivered from the law. The Old Testament law is out. The New Testament law replaced it. OT gone, NT in. Paul goes through and explains it. Then he goes to the nation of Israel, 9, 10, and 11. He goes all through Israel, the history, how they... Got estranged from God, how they get saved now, the future nation of Israel. He explains the difference between a Jewish person and the nation of Israel. A Jewish person is the same as you, me. Everybody's the same. There's not Jews or Greeks. There's not bonds or free. There's not males or female, for you are a one in Christ. Okay? But, he bifurcates the teaching brilliantly, showing that 
the nation of Israel is different from an individual Jewish person. And he explains that and goes into detail and does a great job, obviously. Then he goes through where I'm hitting tonight for us, you know, what are these Christian doctrines you absolutely have to have to serve God? If you have any interest in serving God, this would be a good Bible study for you. The essentials of Christian doctrine start in chapter 12. And then he wraps it up with, uh, you know, some other things at the end, 16. Okay? He goes on to explain in Romans about the laws of God. There's multiple layers of the law of God. Multiple layers. There was the law of Moses. There was the law of the natural world. For example, gravity. For example, breathing air, whatever. There is a law of faith. Okay? The law of faith replaced the law of Moses. It is now the law of faith. Paul explains it. There's the law of your mind, how your mind operates and what you're supposed to do with it. There's a law of sin. Paul explains that. There's the law of righteousness, chapter 9. The laws of God are in chapter 7. The laws of the Holy Ghost, chapter 8. Chapter Eight. And now, how was that introduction? Uh, everybody's real quiet, so I don't know whether, whether or not they're bored or whether they're going, hey, this is kind of interesting. Okay, you were bored, but I'll pick it up here in a minute. I'm going to think of some good jokes to tell you. Chapter 12 in the legendary book of Romans. Here it is. What are you personally supposed to do tonight? What are you supposed to do? God is talking to you. Almighty God said, I beg you, Christians, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. No more Old Testament sacrifices. They're out. The New Testament sacrifice is your body. This is your sacrifice to God. It's holy. You gotta you gotta present your body holy in the same way you had to present the Old Testament sacrifices. They had to be holy. For example, the lamb had to be without what? No spots and no blemishes. Which is what the Lamb of God was on Calvary. Not born in sin, never committed a sin. No spots, no blemishes. God's incredible son. It is your logikos. What is that? We get our English word logical. Okay? God is saying to you, listen, we're not doing goats and calves. We're doing your body. And after what I've done for you, chapters 1 through 11, that's logical for you to turn your body over to God as a living sacrifice. Sometimes it's a dead one. What do we call those? Martyrs. But most of the time, they're living sacrifices. And for example, here tonight, we don't have anybody dead. Physically, I mean. And you are to turn your body over to God as a living sacrifice. Because it's your rational, logical thing to do. In the Old Covenant, you had offerings. You had offerings that were voluntary. Burn offerings, peace offerings, food offerings. And then you had other things that were not optional, but they were mandatory off offerings, as you know. You had the sin offering and the trespass offerings. All those offerings were summed up at Calvary in the body of the Son of God. I'm in a good mood tonight. <laughs> that, that is perfection. Wow. 
Today the offering of God is your body. These kids are offering their body as a living sacrifice to God. Not goats and calves, kids kneeling at the altar. Is pleasing to Jehovah. He really likes that. Goats and calves, no, he don't like that. That's all over with. Blech. Now, you are the sacrifice. Verse 2, do not be sus kematizo. What is that? Sketched to this age I own. Do not be conformed. Do not pattern yourself like somebody sketching a picture. Do not pattern yourself after this age with your body. Then he says, but be metamorpho, morph yourself. Morph yourself. How? By, and the kind of says, renovating your mind into the mind of Christ. When you were living in sin, you, th you were serving the devil, you were a rotten person, you sucked. Your mind was jacked up. Your body was screwed up. You were well on your way to a, the fires of hell. Nobody was going to ever save you. Now that you've been born again, you're a sacrifice, your body. Holy, acceptable to God. It is your logical service. And not just your body, he wants your mind. Whoever gets your mind gets your body. You cannot surrender your body as a living sacrifice. You know who surrenders it? Your mind. Your body doesn't do it on its own. Your body only does what your mind tells it to. You got to renovate your mind. What does that mean? Anakinesis. Metamorpho means to morph your mind into the mind of Christ. Look at this. Boop. See that caterpillar? He morphed into that. You are to morph your mind from a piece of crap into the mind of the living Christ. You are to start thinking like him. You develop his attitudes, his interests. You don't like the crap he doesn't like. You love the things he likes. You renovate your mind. Is that a suggestion? No, it is a commandment. I'm reading the word to you, aren't I? Okay. Metamorphos is where we get an English word morph. This thing just morphed into a Looks like some kind of a butterfly or something. And the kind of this is to renovate your mind. And you see this car here? This thing's a total. You know what that car represents? You! You were a total before mercy knocked on your door. You were a, you were a shipwrecked loser. And you were gutless on top of it. But this car went to the body shop and got renovated. Okay. Why do you have to do that? Why did God require you to do that? So that you could, Dr. Manzo, test what the good, pleasing, complete will of God is. Trans translation, your destiny. Every born-again Christian has a destiny. 98% of them screw it up. I'm trying to get the 2% to 3% tonight. That's my goal, go from 2% to 3%. Every Christian has a destiny. A call from God. 
The Holy Ghost said, That's what, this is what I want you to do. This is your goal in life. You only have one goal. That's it. It's your destiny. Most Christians miss it. But that's because they never read Romans 12. Had everybody read Romans 12, there would be people fulfilling their destiny all over the place. Oh, boy. you got to test it. Okay. It has to be tested. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word should be established. You, you can't have a thought in your head and say, oh, that's God, let's go with it. No. God gives you a thought in your head. It's got to be tested two or three times. If a demon puts a thought in your head, you've got to test it two or three times. If you don't, you're going to end up jacked up and on the wrong road to misery, suffering. That's where you're going to end up. You've got to be able to test it. How do you do that? Through the Word of God. Through your spirit, man. Through the Holy Ghost. Everything has to be tested. You test everything. When I teach here on Friday nights, you go, that was a great teaching, but I'm going to double check Brother Mike. And you're obligated by God to double check me. Just because I said something doesn't make it right. You are what does that mean? Things God likes. What is pleasing to God? What are you doing with your body that doesn't please Him? And what should you be doing with your body that pleases Him? What are you doing with your mind that doesn't please God? What are you doing? Well, you got to renovate it. You got to renew your mind, the mind of Christ. Why? Because you want the total, tell us, complete will of God. You don't want just part of it. You want the whole enchilada. I think that's Arabic. You want all of God's will in your life, not a part of it. Well, brother, my guys want a part of it. Well, you're not going to get along with, with us down here. I'm trying to get you to push yourself in. God's got plans for you. Well, I'm too old for that. That's a lie. I'm too stupid for that. That's a lie. Too sick for that. That's a lie. Everything the devil tells you that's negative is a lie. A pathological liar. John chapter 8. You want the complete will of God. That's what you want right there. Tell us. There we go. Romans, verse 3, I say through the grace given to me, Paul said, to every man not to think more highly than he ought to think of himself. Hooperphroneo means to focus on crazy stuff, stuff that is not pleasing to God. When I was young, I was in eighth grade, I started boxing in, in Anaheim, and I started to do this. I used to have, I used to start focusing on crazy, crazy things. I started telling myself, well, I could be the middleweight champion of the world someday. I could, you know. <laughs> I had delusions in my head. When I went to school, I didn't have very many friends. Uh, you know, I mean, I look great now, but I had these big ears back then. And I wasn't that popular because they were, they kind of stuck out. You know, and, uh, but I used to live in delusions. I used to tell myself, man, I'm good looking. I used to tell me that so over and over. And then, uh, as you know, if you speak out the word, I, I used to be in the Word of Faith, so I kept saying I'm good-looking, and suddenly, boop, I'm gorgeous. It just happened. I don't know how it happened. Froneo means to focus on something. See? God's telling you, don't focus on high things. Oh, the stars, the moon. We just went through a moon thing. Remember that? Oh, the moon's going to do this and that. Who gives a rat's fanny what the moon's doing? 
God wants you to renovate your mind and sacrifice your body here. He don't want you to go to the moon. Plus, he doesn't want you to become a Mooney. That's funny if you knew what a Mooney was. Here's what you're supposed to do. Don't have these crazy ideas. Why? Because they're vain imaginations. This is what cost Satan his kingdom. Satan had everything God could give someone. He lost it all. Everything he lost. Why? He lost control of his mind. Greed. Pride. Snuck in and destroyed him. He wants you to think soberly. Here's why. God, Marizzo, dealt out to every born-again Christian like dealing cards. You got saved here. You got saved here. You just got saved here. You got saved here. What did he, get? What did he give you? A metron. Everybody got the same amount. You got saved there you go. You got a measure of faith. Same as hers. It's yours, same as his. Now, after you're born again, that portion that God gave you changes. Sometimes rapidly, sometimes not at all, sometimes it's abandoned, sometimes it doesn't kick for 10 years. Everybody's different. And everybody, through their free will, and what they focus on, phronema, they determine, they determine whether that faith grows or it stays there or it disappears. But everybody starts out at the same starting line. Boom, the gun goes off, see? Here's a piece of pizza, Metro. Uh, here's a portion, same as yours. You got the same portion of faith Wigglesworth got. You got the same Sister Edder got. You got the same Alexander Dowie. You got the same Amy Simple McPherson. You got the same. You started out the same. You started out the same. Everybody starts out the same. But changes sometimes almost instantly and for the rest of your life you determine how big that pizza gets you want a monster size of pizza up to you but you started out with the same piece he had see am I helping anybody Wigglesworth had the same piece of pizza you got But Wigglesworth said, hey, wait a minute, I don't want my pizza. I want, a, I want a gigantic piece of pizza. Most Christians go, I'm not really interested. I got a little piece, I'm fine. Okay, I'm not talking to you. I'm not interested in you. I'm trying to get somebody who wants a monster piece interested in what I'm saying tonight. That's what I'm after. Verse 4, as we have many members in one body, all the members, melas, what are those? Body parts. There's many body parts on my body. Correct? The body is Christ. The parts are us. We are the body parts to the body of the living Christ. We do not have the same praxis function. My hands don't function the same as my nose. My ear functions different than my toes. Everybody, you're a hand, you're a toe, you're a neck, you're a finger, you're a it depends on what you want. You know, what God wants. Everybody has a different body part, but the whole body then is fit together and works. So we are body parts of Christ. Although we have all different functions. Paul's using just 
you know, general anatomy here to illustrate spiritual things. There's many of us, and we have many body parts, but there's only one body, the total body. There's nobody else. It's the living Christ. There is nothing else and nobody else. We are members or body parts of one another. So if you're a foot, the foot of Christ, and I'm the hand of Christ, we are in the same body, the body of Christ. But you're a foot, and I'm a hand. You were neck. That's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> Necks are usually not interesting. Now, <laughs> let's switch her over to something else. Everybody's a body part, but there's one body, the living Christ. And there it is, melos, body parts. They're all over the place. Even inside of you are body parts, I guess. These are kidneys, that's the stomach, intestines, sphincters, whatever that stuff is. I'm not that good at anatomy, but anyway... And so Paul then says, since you're different body parts, you have different gifts. So a hand would have a different function and a gift than a foot, and so on. <clears throat> All of these things are given to us through God's grace. None of it's given to us because we earned it <coughs> by being wonderful people, gloriously holy and fantastic. <laughs> grace drug me in out of a rattle. That's where I belong. That's who I was, a rattle. See, mercy hunted me down. Then he goes on to some of the hand, the body parts. One of them is what? One might be prophecy. Uh, another one might be faith. You know, Wigglesworth was called the apostle of faith. Right? So, he illustrates here, there's different gifts, and by the way, deliverance works the same way. There's different layers of spirits that people collect over the years, and so when they come here, they start removing these layers. Unfortunately, most of the people we work with stop at a certain level because they're feeling better, and I do my best to boost them forward. I use different techniques. Uh, I'm nice to them. I talk gently to them, I berate them, I talk down to them, I yell at them. I go through my routine like a chameleon, you ever seen a chameleon? That's me, I'm a chameleon, I look around different way. I do my best to get them to press forward. And whatever I gotta do as a chameleon, I will do it to try and inch the person along to get Okay, you got these layers out. Now let's get the third layer out. Well, I feel better here, and you know, I don't know. I'm, the devil's been attacking me after I went through deliverance. Oh, I'm kind of discouraged and I quit. I try to encourage them gently. I try and be nice to them. I'll help them bend over, and then I'll plant this up their fanny. I'll do whatever I got to do to get this person to move to another level. How does that go over? Depends on the person. This one leaves. This one cusses me out. This one tells me to go screw myself. This one goes, oh, you're right. I, I stalled. I don't, so I, the three that rejected me, I go to the fourth one who's actually showing some fruit. So I'll keep pushing on that one. See, it's a pushy ministry is what this is. This is how it works. Different gifts from the body, different deliverance layers. They're all different layers. Very similar, right? For example, one might be diakonia, someone who waits on others. Someone may have a body part of serving others. You know, not too many Christians are good at that. They usually get offended. And then it says, hey, if you have a ministry, your body part of ministering, you know, be patient with it. Learn it. Work your way through it. Maybe you have this body part. Teaching. Okay. Keep teaching. Learning. Make mistakes. Grow. Fix it. Learn more. Make other things interesting. Do, take some more. You know, work your way through it. That's what Paul's saying. You may have a body part that, of a teacher. That's a gift of God. 
you might be in someone who does exhortations. What are those? Well, Paracleo is standing up here. So, she's all jacked up this month. <laughs> so I come up to her, Paracleo, and I go, you're going to get better and God's going to come through Amen. for you. Okay? <laughs> he loves you and I'm helping you. <laughs> yeah. See? I'm using my body part of exhortation. That's what that is. See, I just, you're going to be okay. Amen. See, I'm patting her. Notice that patting? She doesn't listen to me. You backhand them. That's okay. It's anointed. That's the gift of it. See that? That's a body part. Giving is a, is a ministry, a body part. Metadenomous. People, some people are not good givers. Most people are not. But these people that have this gifting, they're very, they're the givers and they're generous people. They like to help people. They like to give. Most Christians don't have that gift, but some of them do, and they're fantastic people. Do it with simplicity, Paul says. Prosistomy, what is that? Somebody who stands up and gives directions. Okay, we're going this direction, then we're going over there, we're going to that room. When you're done in that room, you go down to this room, drill sergeant, you know. Bang, 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 bang. Somebody who stands up and gives directions, showing people what to do. I had that gift, but nobody listened to me. But anyway, <laughs> Eliao, people that are compassionate. That's a body part, a ministry of Christ, compassion. Very few Christians are compassionate. They're basically self-centered. These people have this gift, man, you come to them with a problem, they'll listen to everything you say, they'll think about helping you, they'll try to work it out. Weird. Nobody said anything, but nobody here has that gift. But I mean, if you ever see somebody at a church that has that gift, you'll be quite remarkable. It's quite remarkable how they are interested in people's situation and they care about what's going on with them. Lord, you're going to have to help me here. I'm striking out pretty bad. <clears throat> you got to do it with cheerfulness. Translation, look, what happened to you? Oh, you didn't want to have a neck. Okay, oh, I'm sorry about that. Praise God, though. See, I'm not going to get down because she wants a different neck. Oh, no, a neck. Oh, God, I can see that. See, that's what he's saying there. Don't lose your joy of the Spirit and be cheerful, but be compassionate. See the difference? You don't need to get down in the mud with them and grovel. You can have compassion and not do that. That's what he's saying here. There you go. See, Jesus Christ is the body. There he is. This is his whole body. Everything is him. And then you've got these different body parts that Paul went through. Some people are givers, some people are compassionate, some people are encouragers, exhortation. So what you've got to do is yield yourself to the Spirit and open your heart and present your body a living sacrifice and find out which one of these gifting God wants you to have. Because he has gifts for every Christian and he has a destiny for all Christians. Nobody gets left out. God is a, not a respecter of persons. Some people are great givers. Some people are not. Most people are not, you know. Most people cannot lead. Go here. Go there. Go here. Here's what we're doing. Let's go. You know, there's a quarterback on the team. Usually, the other guys don't have those skills. Everybody has different skills, different giftings that God gives everybody, Right? And you're supposed to get one or more of these gifts. That's your job. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what God wants you to do. He likes that. But you've got to do things first. You've got to turn your body over to the Lord. And that's very hard to do because people are very, very selfish with their body. They only got one body. And some of them will be darned if they'll share it.
Then he says, let agape, unconditional love, be without nupakritos. What is that? Insincerity. A famous Bible scholar once said, it's better to be hated than to be insincerely loved. Well, when I said that, when I read that, I couldn't believe it. This guy must be a genius. I'll bet he's got a great neck. You know what? Then Paul said, listen, since you turned your body over to God and you're renovating your mind, abhor, find disgusting sin and evil. Find it disgusting. Okay? And as you know, almost every Christian who gets saved backslides. Why do they backslide? Because they're kind of riding a fence. There's, there's pleasure in sin, as, as Moses said, as in Hebrews 11, and they kind of ride, you know, they're kind of on the fence on some stuff. This sin here felt good. That sin there gave them some satisfaction. That sin there fed their ego, and they don't hate it. And if you don't hate it, sooner or later you're going to go back to it. In the drug and alcohol business, we call it relapsing. See? You've got to hate what God hates and love what God loves by renovating your mind into the mind of Christ. And if you don't hate it, you'll either go back to it or you'll live with it. If you don't hate demons and hate sickness, hate mental illness, then you've got to live with it. If you don't hate sin, you can, if you're going to get burned. You're playing with fire. You'll go back to it eventually. You'll start drinking again. You'll start using again. You'll start doing whatever again. That's why Paul said, hey, you've got to find this stuff disgusting after you renovate your mind in the mind of Christ because Christ finds it disgusting. Kolao, glue yourself. That's what this means. If this was glue, I'd put it on here. And then I'd, that's kolao. I'd glue it to the wall. Glue yourself to things that are good. How can you do that? You can't unless you renovate your mind. You use your body to do it because you surrendered it as a living sacrifice and your mind told you you're going to do that and that's how you're going to live. Be kindly affectionate to one another. What does that mean? Elastorgus. That's like being in a fraternity or a sorority in college. Anybody in one of those at college? Nobody? I wasn't either. Um, <clears throat> it's like a brotherhood, see, or a sisterhood. We're in this group, so Paul said, since you're in this sorority or fraternity, i.e. Christianity, you are to treat everybody as a brother, see? So when I meet somebody that's got neck problems, I don't criticize them. I treat them lovingly. Because we're in the same fraternity or sorority. We're all, it's brotherly love. You know, it's a group. We're in a group. Okay. Christianity today uh, is, is all jacked up because everybody went into literal groups. Methodists, Episcopals, Lutherans, Church of God, Church of, church of that, Church of this, Church of this, Church of crap. And there it goes. See, that's not what Paul's talking about. The fraternity 
is in Christ. It's a, it's, the sorority is Christ. That's what he's saying. So naturally, if I'm in your group, I get special privileges, friendship, communication, love, how you doing, fun, whatever it is, you're in the same group. It's very similar to a family, right? You get, this family is different from that family. Well, Satan's kingdom of darkness is not part of this fraternity. It's not part of this group. He's in another group, a hell group. With what? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. <laughs> oh, that's kind of a polar opposite of what we're talking about here, but that word means, that word means brotherly, sisterly love, communicable love. Not a sex commune like this 1969 in Haight-Hasbury, but it's this relationship you have because we're all part of the same family. Family. Preferring one another in honor. Prefer one, oh, we're in the same group, so if you need something, I'm going to help you. Don't be ochnurus. What does that mean? You ever met somebody that's late all the time? There's a number of reasons that cause that, but boy, they get on your nerves. Particularly if you are, you are not a late person. If you're punctual and you're having to work with people that are not punctual, it drives you nuts. Paul says, look, don't sit around doing nothing. Be alert and do what you're supposed to do. Step up. Be on time. Zale, turn the gas on. Put the pot on there and boil it. That's what it means. Huh? You're not supposed to be sitting around like a disabled Christian, sitting around looking around, wondering who's going to take care of you. Somebody going to teach me something today? I'll just sit here and do nothing. No, you're supposed to be on fire. You're supposed to be boiling, Jack. Okay, 98% of Christians, no, they're not boiling. They're, they're sitting there with the pots on the stove, but nobody turned on the gas. The gas shut off. They're just sitting there on the pot. Most Christians are pot sitters. Can you blame them? They haven't turned their life or body over to God. They didn't get any of the giftings that God wanted to give them. They don't have any of the blessings God wanted to give them. So yeah, Christianity is boring. It's not exciting at all. No wonder they don't. They're not interested. You got to be boiling in spirit. Greek verb, verb uh, to leo, Deluo means to work as a slave. This is the body of Christ, and I'm the hand. So the hand does whatever the body tells it to. Pick that up, grab that, turn that, get that screwdriver, put that over there, go do that. And the, button, the hand just does it. Because the hand's a slave. Your body parts are a slave to the person. The body part body of Christ your foot's a slave to God walk that way go over here stop God tells you to read this body part eyes oh study that look at that the body tells your eyes what to look at okay. can I take a break I need to get some porn no, you can't. You turned your body a living sacrifice to God. You're not on porn anymore. You're not doing that anymore. You're now, your eyes are now a slave to the body, Christ. That's what he's saying here. I'm just using different words, but this is what he's getting at. Rejoice in hope. Why is that? Listen, Christians who lose hope amount to nothing. 
They're chronic systematic failures. Because sometimes Christianity is hard. And being a hand and a foot and being told what to do all the time, you've got to have some perseverance. You've got to have some dedication. You've got to have, be able to push yourself. You've got to be able to make sacrifices. And sometimes that's not fun. See? My body part was hands, and I was a surgeon. Then I have, I put her down, put her to sleep. Then I cut open here, move that, move it, fix that over. There. See, I'm, the body told me to fix. See, I'm doing that. The hands don't make their own decisions. They just do what they're told. And if you don't have any hope, you're going to get burned out. Because some, sometimes serving God is, is not fun. There's not a lot of fun in it. I just told you about some of the unfun things I do. You think I like slapping people around? I do not like it. But I have hope. Someday I'm going to be out of here. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm going to be somewhere up there listening for somebody to call my name. I keep that hope there, even though some of the stuff isn't, stuff isn't fun. Not everything's fun, to say the least. What does God want you to be? Oh, no, the hardest thing in the world. Hupo Bonnet, developing endurance. That's the toughest thing for a Christian, man. You wouldn't believe it. So hard. Patience, the toughest thing. It took me years to develop it. I got the patience of Job with people. Patience of Job. I can sit down and talk to somebody for X amount of time, could be a long time, and never hear one thing that made sense. They were on their mouth like a busted chainsaw. That doesn't even bother me. With the exception of a wife. But back to this, you got patience means you got to develop endurance because nobody can make it to heaven that doesn't have it. You got to be able to endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, Timothy. And then what? What is tribulation? Philipsis, it's pressure. Okay? If you want to be a hand of Christ, the devil's going to try to chop your hands off. He's going to try to get you to pick up a bunch of arthritis demons so your hands don't work anymore. He's going to do anything he can to stop you from using your hands for the body of Christ. Anything. He's going to put the pressure on you. What's the problem? Most Christians, are, they're gutless. Most Christians got saved by some TV preacher telling them that Christianity was a cakewalk and everything is fantastic when you come to Christ. So much fun being a Christian. That's a crock. As soon as you become a Christian, the devil puts a target on your back. He comes hunting for you. He wasn't hunting for you before because he had you. You were unsaved. You were a servant of Satan. Period. There's no reason to go looking for you. You're right there for him. Now that you're saved, you're trying to get away from him. He's a stalker. He's going to come for you. You're going to put the pressure on you. Most Christians can't handle the pressure. You've got to develop endurance, patience to handle the pressure. No Christian that hasn't turned their body over to the living sacrifice can handle the pressure. They all crack. All the Christians that haven't renewed their mind, they all fall apart. All of them, 100%. They miss their destiny. Then he mentions social work here. A lot of people really have that gift, a gift of hospitality. You know, fabulous. 
Bless those who persecute you. What's he talking about? Well, Paul said, listen, if you turn your body over as a living sacrifice and you start renovating your mind to think like Jesus, hell is coming to breakfast at your house. And people are going to turn on you. Family members are going to turn on you. Your friends are going to turn on you. Church people are going to turn on you. They're going to come after you. They're going to pursue you. So what you want to do is kick them in the back and shoot them. No, you go the opposite direction. Okay, you renewed your mind so you're not going to take an offense against this person. You're going to bless them when they trashed you. The government, the medical profession, your family, the people at work. Everybody gets trashed. Nobody's immune from not getting trashed. That's right. The question is, are you going to become trash? That's up to your free will. You decide. They're going to pursue you and you're going to return it with vindictiveness, anger, frustration, telling them off. No. Paul said you can't do that. It's going to rot your spirit out. You're not going to be boiling in spirit anymore. You're going to fizzle out. Can't take offenses. That's the cancer of Christians, taking an offense. Relatives, brothers, sisters, parents, people at work. Why is taking offenses so bad? Do you ever think about it? Because you're putting yourself on a pedestal. What? You, who are you talking to, Willis? Well, you put yourself up here and you don't think you ought to be talked to like that. Paul got through telling you, point blank range, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. See, people that take offenses, it's always the same thing. They're trying to elevate themselves over the person that's blasting them. That's what it is. And Paul said, you can't do that. You're thinking too highly of yourself. Well, I just shouldn't be talked to like that. Well, actually, you should. And if they do it, you're going to return blessing. And you're going to not return any of that. You're going to forgive them and crank it. That's what he's trying to get across here. These are the ABCs of Christian life. Romans 12. Well, they gave me a good cousin, Brother Mike, and I wasn't at fault. They were at fault. Oh, welcome to marriage. Uh, you don't curse them back. See, because that boomerang's on you. Well, F you. Whoop, the demons go, oh, you said F you? F you. Now they boomerang it back, and they put a curse on you. Because you curse them. Because they cursed you. Screw turning the other cheek. Pfft. Well, did you hear that? That boomerang back on you. You're going to get screwed. And later on, somebody's not going to turn the other cheek when you do something wrong. And you're going to get hit. You decide to give somebody a piece of your mind? I wouldn't do it. You're down to two or three pieces. But as soon as you give somebody a piece of your mind, later on, somebody will give them you a piece of their mind. Everybody reaps what they sow. In the natural world and the physical world and the spirit world. You're going to get it right back. Let's uh, leave this area quickly. I didn't go over well. Rejoice with them that rejoice. What is that? Here's, here's the counselor's creed. Anybody here a counselor, therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever? That's, that's our, this is our verse, okay? It's called what? Empathy. Ah. My ability to see your 
life and your problem from your perspective, not me imposing my values on you. I'm looking at your eyes. That's empathy. And if you don't have it, there's no way for you to be social worker, counselor, psychiatrist. You can't do that kind of work. You got to be able to see stuff from their perspective. You know, like my granddad used to say, did you, have you walked a mile in their moccasins? Okay. When I was a kid, I didn't know what he was talking about. We didn't ha I didn't have any moccasins. Later on, when I grew I said, yeah, my granddad, guy's a genius. Yeah, you gotta, if you don't under, you wouldn't understand somebody if you, unless you went through what they went through. Well, not everybody can do that, so you gotta be able to develop empathy. Okay. I don't have any knowledge when somebody comes in for counseling, they've been raped. I've never been raped. Okay, I don't technically know how that feels, but I've learned empathy. I'm looking at it from how they're seeing it, the pain they're suffering, the damage it caused them. I'm trying to see it through their eyes, not mine, because I have never done that. Right? It's not sympathy, it's empathy. Sympathy is, oh, you, oh, so you blew your knee out? Oh, man, that's too bad. That's awful. That's not empathy. I'm having sympathy on the person. Right? Oh, you need a brace? I might have the gift of compassion. Here, I'll get you a brace. Or giving. Here's a brace. But that's not empathy. What's the first thing to go in a rotten marriage? Empathy. You don't see things the way they see it. So the marriage tanks. <clears throat> I spent a lot of time and energy saving a marriage recently. Everything was going great. It was unbelievable. A miraculous turnaround. Until the other relatives came over. Yeah. Heading for the divorce now. All that time and energy I put in, gone. But I was able to help him because I was using empathy. I saw the husband's view of the marriage. I saw her view of the marriage. Okay. What he's telling you here is don't start weeping with people that are rejoicing. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh no. You're not doing enough. No. You rejoice with them. And if they're weeping, you don't start cracking joke. No, oh, what happened? Let me think about this. How did that, how were you feel? What happened to you? See, I don't start cracking jokes while they're weeping, is what Paul's saying. Go with the person, support them. <clears throat> and then do what? Focus, froneo. You have to focus on the things other people focus on to, in order to understand them correct you can't impose your opinions your thoughts into their mind they have to be able to do it themselves you can't be telling everybody what to do all the time they're going to turn on you My marriage is going great. Now how do I do that? Well, I just learned to, learned to say, uh, what do you want me to do? Um, where should we go? Where do we eat? <laughs> you want me to trim my neck down? I go, I, I... Do not man high think, hey, listen, this is, humanity's down here, and UFOs and Bigfoot and all this other crap, that's out there. This is where you, your giftings, your body parts, 
work here. This isn't new age. Translation, do not mind new age. All this ethereal crap. It's all demonic. Condescend to men of low estates. What is that? Senator Pago. Hey, look, somebody's down. They're having a tough time. Hey, you know, go down there and sit with them. You know, kind of, well, you shouldn't have done it that way. Didn't I tell you to do that? No, no, hey, wait a minute. The person's down, you know. People that feed the homeless are really good at that. You ever seen a homeless ministry? They go out and help. They, they kind of put themselves in their kind of slot down there. They come off their high horse, as my granddad used to say, and they come down there, so to speak. So what Paul's saying. Low estate, people that have been topping us, you know, beat down, whipped, going through tough times, struggling. You know, don't be wise in your own conceits. In other words, translation, hey, to stop focusing on yourself. Your gifting is from God. Hands, feet, nose, eyes, what ears. Your body parts, you belong to Christ. You have these giftings. What are they? Compassion, prophecy, different gifts. Hey, stop focusing on yourself. Go over here. It's hard for Christians to do. They're very self-centered people. It's awful. Verse 17, do not recompense evil for evil. What do you know? Pay them back. Some Christians are very spiritual when they get screwed over. They won't pay them back, but they'll go to the Lord. Lord, can you kick their faces in? They stabbed me in the back. They stole this. They did. No, that's not the prayer. That, that's not, no. That's not the point of the verse. You don't go ask God to send them a lightning bolt. Boom, up the fanny. No. No, somebody trashes you. That's, you're not going to return trash. Right? <laughs> Do everything honestly. <laughs> what? Oh my gosh. That's hard to believe. I, I better get off that. If possible, if you're able to do it, live with peace with all men. Pursue peace. Right? Dearly beloved, act to kale. Do not take revenge on people. If you get screwed over, don't take revenge. Brother Mike, I hate this Bible study. Okay, now listen. <clears throat> if you'll follow these commandments of God, you're going to be so powerful spiritually, you won't even believe it. Paul's going this, through this whole laundry list and he's really telling you, let me sum it up. Let me sum it up in a strange fashion. He's warning you about people. And how you're to react to other people. That's what he's telling you. That's kind of the laundry list. That he's telling you, look. Somebody screws you over, hey, you don't, you bless them, you don't curse them back. You do not take revenge on them, okay? But give place to anger. Orge is anger. <clears throat> Tapas is what? What's a topographer or an English, English term? What? Map. Map. I just heard a divinely inspired word, map. That is correct. Now, for example, here is a map of Arizona. See that? And God said, oh, wait a minute. This is actually you. Okay, this is you. And he's telling you, look, in this area of your life, boop, 
Maricopa County, you don't give the devil any chance to move into that county. You keep him out. You don't let him come here. You don't let him go in that section. Is what Paul's saying. Uh, maybe this is your mind. Maybe this is your soul. Maybe that's your emotions. Whatever it is, don't give any place, area, to the devil. Particularly in your mind. That will guarantee you, and as Rocky used to say, you'll end up a bum. Your mind is the key to victory. Give no place to the devil. It is written, Deuteronomy 32, Paul quotes out of the Old Testament, and he said, it is written, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Hey, if you get screwed over, God saw it, he saw the whole thing. He saw it coming. Now he sees it going. Okay? Nothing happens to you. The Holy Ghost hasn't already seen. He saw it coming. In my last two podcasts ago, I gave my old teaching again. The fight is fixed. Did any of you happen to see that? That's a great teaching. The devil's coming at you, and the Holy Ghost already knows he's coming. And he already has planned out, he gets a butt whooping. Before he gets to you, it's all planned out, he gets his face kicked in. How come it doesn't happen? He needs you to cooperate. If you don't cooperate, oop, God's plans explode. There is no temptation taking you. Such is common to man, but God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able to bear. That's what Paul told the Corinthians, right? Well, how does that actually work? What is that? The Holy Ghost saw him coming. The devil can't sneak up on you. It's impossible. Father sees it coming. And already implemented a plan for you to escape. It's all set up. All he needs is your cooperation. If you don't give it, you get screwed. There's nothing God can do about it. I had it all set up for you. The devil was going to get it over here. And you didn't cooperate. So now you've got to pay for it. Now you're broke. Now your emotions are shot. Now you're mentally ill. Now your things are falling apart. Finances crack. Hey. God saw all that coming before it got there. All you need to do is cooperate, and everything works out. All things work to good, yes, to those who love God, right? How come most Christians have everything jacked up? Because they don't love God. Why not? They didn't turn their body over to God as a living sacrifice. You can't have a bunch of stinking vices and turn your body over to God as a living sacrifice. Smoking too much, drinking too much, taking too many drugs, eating too much food, crapping here. Stop! That's not... Turning your body over to God. You did that when you were a sinner. You ate too much. You drank too much. You that was a sinner's lifestyle. Not anymore. You're not there anymore. You, you're surrendering your body. You were a slave now, man. You want to fulfill your destiny. You want God's giftings. You want to be part of the body. Oh, I'd like to be a hand. Oh, I'd like to be a nose. I'd like to. Whatever God wants you to be, go ahead and do it. But you don't take vengeance on people. And then Paul quotes out of Proverbs 25, right? He says something that, you know, a very small percent of Christians can do. Love your enemy. Ekthros means people who hate you. Hate, haters. 
What do you do to him? Hate him back? Oh, man. No. You do the opposite. Why? Because you've renewed your mind. You think like Jesus. Instead of paying him back, you're going to bless him back. Heaping coals of fire, that's a description of somebody's conscience being convicted. That's all that is. I screwed you over and you did this for me? Oh my gosh, what am I doing? The Holy Spirit's able to convict them for how they treated you. But they can't do it if you want to take vengeance on them. Then it all goes out the window and you collapse. And collapsing is something Christians are really good at. Very talented. Do not be overcome of evil. Nakao means to be conquered. It's a military term. Conquerors. Conquer evil with... There you go. You can't do that if you haven't surrendered your body as a living sacrifice. You can't do that if you haven't... Kindness and love. Okay. I just threw that in for you. That was just an additional treat. There it is, conquering. How do you do that? Buying guns and weapons about no, to be a powerful conqueror of God, you get on your knees. That's when Satan's kingdom dismantles right in front of your eyes. That is a conqueror. Somebody who prays. Revelation chapter 2, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Holy Spirit is talking to you. The Holy Ghost runs the churches. He's in charge now. He talks to you and he's saying, he that Nikao conquers gets certain benefits. What are those benefits? Well, let's go over one of them. You don't go to hell. Conquerors do not go to hell in Christ. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. He that conquers, Jesus said, I will give to eat of the tree of life. Translation, you get to live for eternity in glory. Providing you're a conqueror. Brother Mike, what happens if I'm not one? Then you don't get these benefits. You also get to be in the middle of the paradise of God. Wow. Wow. He that conquers, overcomes, shall be wearing, wearing white. What's that symbolic of? Holiness and purity. You're perfect. You get the righteousness of God in Christ given to you. You're gorgeous. Some of us, uh, you know, started out that early, but eventually you will be clothed in white. You will be spectacular. None of you will have large necks. Nobody. <laughs> Number four, if you're a conqueror, you will what? Your name's in the book of life. It will never be removed. For eternity, your name is in the book of life. How about if I'm a screw up and I fail at everything? Well, not. According to this, you're not in the book. You've got to be a conqueror to keep your book name in that book. Here it is, the book of life. Your name's in that book. It's there somewhere. Somebody looks it up eventually. Five. Jesus said, I will confess you before his father, if you are a conqueror, and before his angels. What's that like? I have no idea, but I think it's something great. <laughs> Number six. What do you get if you're a conqueror? You will be a pillar in the temple of God. What does that mean? You'll be serving God for eternity. You'll be, you'll have some great job in heaven, whatever it is, I don't know. Pillars and temples are big, beautiful things. And you're never going to go out anymore. You get to go home. You're never, you're never going to leave. That's great. I like that idea. There you are. So you're a pillar. See that? You're a pillar. 
If you're not a conqueror, you're down here, a stepping stone. People walk all over you. Here's your pillar right there. That's what you want to be right there. Something big. Seven. Jesus writes Jehovah's name on you. How does that work? I don't know. But I think it's something great. Number eight. He writes down the name of what? The city of God. Wow. What's that like? I don't know. I think it's wonderful. That's my guess. Nine. You get a new name. Jesus gives you his new name. He's not Jesus anymore up there. He's not Isis. He's not Jesus. He's not, you know, there's like a hundred names for Jesus, right? Every language in the world has a name for Christ. But his real name, who he really is, is given to you. He writes it, writes it on you. That means you're his. That's, he's putting a mark on you saying, this person is mine for eternity, and they're a pillar in my temple. I'm going to introduce him to my father. Wow, look at all these benefits for being a conqueror. I is this motivating you not to be a spiritual loser anymore? What, are you interested in giving your body a living sacrifice? There's all kinds of benefits to it. Don't take my word for it. Take this word for it. Uh-oh. Ten. We get to sit with Christ on his throne. How does that work? I don't know. I assume they shuffle them in and out, or maybe like a carnival. But whatever that is or whatever it means, I think it's something great. That's my guess. So there's the sacrifices you make here to overcome your trials, your temptations, whatever it is, pays big dividends in eternity. I mean, a huge payout. Monstrous payout. I had to do it myself, Jesus said. Wow. I overcame, and so I sit with my Father on his throne. We overcame, we get to sit with Jesus on his throne. It's, it's, some, it's like some kind of a sitting thing. But it's got to be something great. That's, a, that's my guess. This is fantastic somehow. John 16. Let's get ready to wrap up here. I know you don't want me to stop teaching. I can see it on your faces. I have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. Wow. For in the world you will have, same Greek word, philipsis, what? Pressure. You're going to have a lot of pressure in this world. Be of good cheer. I have conquered, Nikao, I conquered cosmos, the human world. He doesn't mean he conquered the worlds, you know, the galaxy over here, Jupiter. No, he's talking about us, this world, the human world. God, the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, received in the glory. God became one of us. Ugh. You imagine being God and becoming a human? Ooh! Gag me with a spoon. My body, you know, I mean, my, I look great, but actually, my body kind of sucks. You know, it, for example, sometimes it stinks. Sometimes I get aches and pains. Sometimes my neck swells. Sometimes. Sometimes my body just is, it feels like a piece of crap. He became a human, if you can believe that. God became a human. That's hard to, I can't fit that in here, to be honest with you. I don't get it. But I believe it because I read it. 
See, I don't have to understand everything to walk by faith, not by sight. I walk by faith, not by sight. I walk by faith, not by my emotions. Because I know those things will betray me. If I don't understand something, I just receive it by faith. I got no choice. I can't figure it out. I overcame humanity. He did. No sin. How do you live a sinless life? I don't, I, that's not registering. Wasn't born in sin. I don't, how does that work? I don't know. I can't explain some of these things, but the Bible says it's true, and therefore, since God's word said it's true, I believe it. That's, that's my bent. How about you? If he said it, then that's, that's good enough for me. If I don't have to get it. So I don't understand all these things, but you are to be of good cheer anyway. I know what that means. Be of good cheer. He overcame what we are going through right now. The devil's putting the pressure on us. He already overcame it. Is what he's saying. Fabulous. Do not. Same verse, verse 21, backing up. Do not be conquered by evil. Conquer evil with good. And that would conclude the Bible study. <clears throat> How'd that go? Any, anybody upset at me? Check with the YouTubers. Now listen, let's go to prayer now. There's some things that the devil has come.